October 16th this year marks 60 years of what is known as the Cuban Missile Crisis. A tense two weeks in which it seemed like the United States and the USSR might engage in full-fledged nuclear war. Uh, reports of that time talk about a lot of tension, a lot of concern, uh, worries on a day-to-day -day basis whether this would be the end of humanity as we know it. Of course it wasn't and we learned a lot of lessons from that. But this is not just a story of 60 years ago, it's also a story of today. Many of these concerns still remaining in our mind at this point of time. We'll be discussing all this in this episode of Mapping Fault Lines. We have with us Prabir Prakashtha. Prabir, so uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, of course, uh, now finding a place in history books. Now a lot of people are talking about it because it's the 60th anniversary. And when you read the reports, you can really feel the palpable tension, you know, people thinking about what would happen on a day-to-day -day basis. So, uh, 60 years down the line, could you just maybe take us through what really happened? Because the convenient, there's some convenient narratives about how the USSR and its expansion moves, etc., etc. So, could you just maybe first take us through how we understand it today? Well, I would generally describe first three things uh, regarding what I remember of the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, because we were... I was in school at the time, quite a senior student in the school, class 11 or something. And I still remember, this was co-termed, this was India, China also having on the Himalayan borders right. a major war, a border war that, that was taking place. So we had two crises, so to say, to talk or think about at that time. And uh, frankly speaking, for a lot of people in India, the Himalayan crisis overtook the, even the Cuban Missile Crisis, though the second was a possibility of ending human civilization. The third, second point is, of course, that the current scenario with respect to Ukraine and the fact that the United States president himself is talking about that a nuclear threat has been made. But if you look at what Putin has said, whether it should be construed as a nuclear threat or not, and if you look at all the other threats which have been coming from a number of other players, should, should we really talk about this as uh, a nuclear threat, particularly when Zelensky has talked about a preemptive strike right. against uh, Russia. So that's the second part of the story. The third part of the story, which you also you have referred to, is that while it's looked at the Cuban Missile Crisis, but what is not, con you know, or what is conveniently forgotten is the fact that there were also missiles, nuclear missiles uh, positioned in uh, Turkey, quite close to Russia, and Soviet Union at the time, and also in Italy. And uh, this, these were not public at that point. People did not know right. that nuclear missiles had been positioned. Neither were they aware that post-Cuban missile crisis, one part of the settlement was withdrawing also these missiles from Turkey. So these, this is the background within which we'll have to see it. You are absolutely right. The world not only was, as we know, publicly close to war, and something which could have ended in a nuclear exchange. But also, there were physical times, physically, where we were very close to an accidental war. The tragedy was it was not an order given by either the President of the United States or the Prime Minister of uh, Russia, Soviet Union, but it were really accidents that could have led to a nuclear exchange. Of course, accidents have happened all along with nuclear right. weapons that we know. But these are particularly important because they're taking place at a time where you really had the, you were really on razor uh, thin margins of a, of a war starting. So that was particularly dangerous. And the fact that we were at least the three occasions where we can talk about a nuclear war being triggered accidentally all within those two weeks that you talked about. I think that's very important to remember today because we seem to be stepping into a similar kind of scenario right. without even the kind of concerns that people had in 1962. Right, Prabhupada. So in that context, of course, uh, an important thing like you mentioned is that despite tensions rising to a great high, there was actually negotiation and dialogue that took place even in that very tense moment when these two, these two powers were you know, almost on the verge of war. And there were talks, there were negotiations uh, disp between people who seemed like you know, enemies without, where there was no space. But we look at the situation today and you know, we are again uh, in a war like we have pointed out, Russia is in a war with NATO, it's not Russia and Ukraine really. But we see a, pal we see a complete absence of uh, dialogue and uh, rhetoric at an unprecedented 
high that's happening right now. So, how do you sort of analyze, you know, what has what has led to this situation, like what we call the Cold War 60 years ago, even then there was there was scope for dialogue, there was scope for some kind of exchange, whereas now we see that the war has going, been going on for so many months and there is nothing happening at all. You know, one of the things I think that the world has become completely blasé about the possibility of a nuclear war. We have lived with nuclear weapons for so long, we believe that nothing is going to happen. So therefore, a conventional war can take place. NATO can pump in as much weapons as it wants into Ukraine. Different kinds of weapons uh, quite possibly be involved in blowing up the North Stream right. 1 and 2 pipelines. Uh, quite possibly being at least instigated, if not the ones who per actually per did this, uh, blowing up the Kerch Bridge, which Russia had said is a really a red line for them. So all of this does not seem to have penetrated the consciousness of either the people or the leadership that actually these are nuclear weapon states, that NATO has nuclear weapons, the United States of course, and R Russia has nuclear weapons. And therefore, any exchange that starts between NATO and, the, and Russia could conceivably uh, tip over into a nuclear exchange. So this is, this is one part of it, and you're quite right. Why is it that we don't think of it in the same way we did it in 1962? And I think the two lessons which are, have not been learned is one which you've talked about, that the lines of communication were kept open by both sides. And there was continuous negotiations. Could you bring the, uh, this whole thing down, ratchet this whole thing down and reach some kind of an agreement? And it was two weeks within which this agreement was reached. Right. So therefore, that is one part of it. The second part of it, we really have not internalized how close we were to war, nuclear war. And I'll give you three instances. One of it, I mean, each of it is tragic comedy, but one of it is really more comedy than even uh, considering the fact we're so close to nuclear war, that a bear tried to enter one uh, base and triggered off what's called an intruder alert. Normally it shouldn't have caused any problem, except that it was wired to another base 200 uh, miles away, and the wiring was not done right. This is always how human failures can lead to dangerous positions. And therefore, it did not trigger an intruder alert. It said that you have to immediately uh, be airborne and prepared for combat, which meant that the Russia-Soviet uh, strike force was actually coming right. across Canada if you will, over the North Pole, and therefore the aircraft had to fly. And somebody realized this was the wrong order, checked it up, and then there was no way to recall the, air, uh, the captains of the uh, aircraft. So he took a jeep and actually positioned it on the runway and stopped the flight. The second one we know about, which is regarding the nuclear submarines, in, uh, in which one of the commanders of the submarine was on the verge of firing a nuclear weapon and uh, his political officer agreed, but the flotilla commander was Arkhipov, and he said, no, no way you're going to fire a nuclear weapon. We need to surface and check before we do it. And that's how the nuclear weapon was not fired. And we have another case where we also know that by mistake, a command was given to fire nuclear weapons, and it's only because it was checked and then found that this was wrong order and uh, that the person concerned apparently was retired, but he might have retired the whole world before that. This also shows how nuclear exchange by just sheer accident, stupidity, human error, wrong wiring in this particular case, any of these cases, we can come to the brink of extinction. And I think that is why the need to think of the, the what's happening in Ukraine, uh, not simply as a war between NATO and Russia, but also something which is dangerous in the future of our civilization. But probably specifically in the context you were talking about, there have been reports of Putin's threats. You mentioned a bit about it, but could you just elaborate a bit more? You know, this is the whole issue. The Putin, what he has said, that if Russia's existence is threatened as a country, they can use any weapons that, uh, that is at their disposal. Now, this is the formal position of the United States in any case. In fact, they go further. They can use 
all weapons, including weapons of mass destruction, if they feel that there is an attack on them, likely, which is what's called a preventive war. So it's not a response to nuclear weapons. It's what is being called as that they could use it as preventive war. Now, there is no provision in international law of a preventive war, nor is there any potential, possibly uh, any provision for a weapon of mass destruction being used in that form. The only question which the International Court of Justice left open is if the existence of a country is threatened, do they have the right to use nuclear weapons or not, at which point the International Court of Justice said, we can't comment on that. Unfortunately, that is the provision which is used in order to justify nuclear weapons being held by countries. But the point is that this position is what in fact, has been stated by Putin, if you take it, that if Russia's existence is threatened, that they can use nuclear weapons. Are, is anybody threatening Russia's existence at the moment? Yeah. So this whole argument that Putin has talked about using nuclear weapons, I think is really uh, something which is, I, I would call as uh, red herring if you will, or something by which you are really ratcheting up the nuclear tension. And then you start talking about protein has threatened nuclear weapons, protein, protein has threatened the use of nuclear weapons. Nobody is actually going back and reading what is he has said, in what context it's been said. And unfortunately, the media is at the moment completely one-sided. The international media seems to be completely one-sided. and. Whether there, whatever happens to the military war on the ground, the, certainly the United States and its allies are certainly winning the media war. Right. The, that, that is very much, very much clear. So we're really hearing, if you read the news, you only hear one side of the story. Most of the world cannot even access RT and other Russian uh, agencies uh, because most of them have been blocked. And in any case, if you read a number of these uh, channels which give the Russian side, they are all supposed to be fake news sites. So we have this whole, also the media onslaught, which spins this thing in a very different way. Right. Then you have President Biden saying things, you have uh, NATO leaders saying things, and then it appears that we are at the threshold of a nuclear war, all because Putin has apparently threatened it, which is certainly not at least the case that we can see from reading the transcripts of what he has said. Right. I mean, moving on to our next question, question we have often addressed on this show, I mean, the number of nuclear weapons has come down in the decades uh, since 1962. We have, but the still US, the Russia and the US together, I think, have about 13,000 nuclear weapons. Uh, there, is, there are constant issues like the you know, Iran issue, for instance, where uh, the talk of nuclear weapons is Israel, for instance, has continuously raised temperatures on that. We have tensions in the Korean Peninsula. So uh, have you also seen, uh, considering what we have been through over the past many decades, a complete failure as a global community in addressing the issue of nuclear weapons? I would add to your list also the India-Pakistan issue. Absolutely right, yeah. Because the nuclear powers, and we have tensions on our borders, as well as India-China. So yes, we are very much a part of this uh, right. nuclear tensions in that exist in the world. I think the basic, as I said, ki, there, this, there, there is no peace movement today. And the real issue is that it came on the agenda of the world because there was a global peace movement. Uh -huh. That is what is one missing element today. And that's, that, that is one which forced a lot of the countries then to address it through negotiations. And finally, the realization that this is something that would not, that is not a usable weapon. Therefore, all other weapons are okay, but this weapon, there is really no need to see how many times we can blow up the world. So this mutual assured destruction model, right. which is that each side then has more weapons to counter if 80%, 90% of its weapons are taken out in the first strike, therefore the second strike. Then if there are anti-missiles, therefore the second strike can also be aborted. So this is how this whole thing gets ratcheted up. And we are entering that cycle again. If you remember that the one of the consequences of all those movements demanding started actually with the neutron bomb, no to neutron bomb, no positioning of nuclear weapons in Europe, uh, at Western Europe, 
which all of these movements which were there at that point of time. The issue really was that nuclear weapons are not a weapon that can be used. Therefore, it should not be weapons that should be used as a tactical nuclear weapon. And therefore, having anti-ballistic missile shield essentially makes it possible for you to think you can win a nuclear war with the first strike and taking out the returned strike right. with your ABM uh, weapons. So anti-ballistic missile shields were considered not something which would help bringing peace. And only one set of anti-ballistic missile shields were actually accepted in the, the treaty that was signed by the US as well as Soviet Union at that point and the, later on Russia. But unfortunately, what happened was that the George Bush really withdrew from that. It started with Clinton, but formally George Bush withdrew out of it. George Bush too withdrew out of it. And then we have the further things that happened when Trump withdrew out of the Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile Treaty. And the current one, the only one that we have now is a peace treaty, the START to SALT 1, SALT 2, the only ones that exist at the moment, it's also nearing its end in 2026. So what is going to happen is not clear. It is known that the United States is going to spend nearly a trillion dollars upgrading its nuclear missile, nuclear uh, weaponry. We don't know how much uh, Russia is going to spend. So we seem to be entering again the cycle of winnable nuclear wars. And I think that's that mindset that we can strike and win is the one which is really the most dangerous at the moment. And we hear nuclear uh, proponents in the United States openly saying that if we do A, B, C, D, then we can win the nuclear war. All we need is better missile shields, and then we are through. I think those are the kind of things which are really, really dangerous. Thank you so much, Fabir. So there we have it. We have spent decades living under the shadow of nuclear weapons, but we are no closer to eliminating it, to removing the danger than we were in 1962. We'll be discussing many such issues in future episodes of Mapping Fault Lines. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.